if I can get this to cooperate. Okay. Um, the title of this week's lecture, even though it's Entities, Attributes, and Relationships, there's actually a little bit more content to it. Um, specifically, I just start talking about data modeling in general. And we're going to be more precise. We're going to learn more in specifics as we go along. Um, for starters, what is data modeling? Um, anybody here ever be a project lead, not for a school assignment, but actually like in a real job? Where you end up being in charge of a group of people? Where you have to accomplish something? Okay, good, at least one. And usually this is fairly similar process as building, planning to build a house or, you know, putting in new greenery at the park, that kind of thing. The very first step you have is requirements gathering. Requirements gathering is you find out what you need to do. In other words, you sit down, you talk to the customer. Yes, you're working with computers, and yes, you're going to have to talk to people. As much as many of you were hoping that you're going to sit behind a desk in the dark, avoiding reality, and pretending the world doesn't exist, yeah, you're going to have to talk to people. That's just how it is. Um, sometimes requirement gathering means you go take a trip to your manager's office and you ask him, questions, him or her questions. Or sometimes you actually have to talk to customers. Um, another part of data modeling is exploring data structures. In other words, after you figured out the requirements of something, you start exploring all the data and figuring out how it's related, how it's broken down, that kind of stuff. And data modeling specifically uses um, three pieces of terminology. Entities, instances, and attributes. And I'll be getting into details in those in further slides. Now, when we're doing data modeling, this is the side where it's about drawing pictures, literally. Um, and the really strange thing about data modeling is it's very organic. With programming, there's best practices for everything. Even if you think there isn't a best way of doing something, somebody out there has already done it and probably found a better way than what you're about to come up with. Just saying. Unless, you know, you're one of those people that comes up with something very unique that's never been seen before. Um, but usually those are people with lots of experience or, you know, have been in the job for a while kind of thing. Um, so it's very organic. So we end up using models and diagrams for everything. Um, and there's three kinds of models that we're going to deal with. When it comes to database design and enterprise planning, there is tons and tons of diagrams. Uh, there's data flow diagrams. Um, there's um, enterprise entity diagrams, enterprise object diagrams. We're not dealing with any of those in this course. We're going to just worry about the database itself. And the three styles of models that you create, the three kinds of diagrams, is the conceptual, the logical, and the physical. And I'm going to break those down. Now, a conceptual diagram includes all the important entities and the relationships. Now, obviously I haven't defined what those are yet, but it's a chicken before the egg. I can talk about one or the other, and without both, it, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but essentially, it's a bare bones diagram. It may or may not list the attributes. Again, I'll be discussing what those are in a minute, or 20. Um, if it's what they call a regular conceptual diagram, then there's no attributes. If it's what they call an extended conceptual, then it includes the attributes. And there's never any primary keys defined on this unless you're talking about extended. And even then, that's, it's iffy. Um, essentially, conceptual diagrams use three, three items of notation, I guess is the right way to describe it. Three, uh, three symbols, or I should say two and a half symbols. And your, the two symbols are as follows that you'd use. One's a square. The square is the entity. You got a diamond, which mine really sucks. The diamond refers to the relationship. In other words, how are the entities connected? And you use a line to connect them. Mind-blowing. 
Um, but essentially, when you talk about a conceptual diagram, these are the only things you'll find in here. Uh, normally, you wouldn't have the word entity. You'd have what the entity's called here. And the relationship is usually a verb. When I start talking about relationships in a bit, when I start describing how they connect, you'll see what I mean by their verbs. After you've got this done, which I'm not going to bother drawing the board because it gets actually really, really messy at this point. You have something called a logical diagram. The logical diagram has all the entities, all the relationships between them, all the attributes for each entity is defined. In other words, it's a better picture. Anybody here actually draw, like for fun? Artistically draw? And so I've got a couple. I know some people are shy. They don't want to admit they draw cat girls. You know, whatever. Each their own. But actually, you'd be surprised I did that once and I had three people leave the room when I said that. So I embarrassed three people without knowing. Um, but, you know, it, you know when you start to draw, usually you do a rough outline, then you start filling in the details. This is your rough outline. The logical diagram has all the details, but none of the color, let's call it. So that means you have all the attributes, all the little things that identify something are listed. The primary key, I'll be discussing this also today. Uh, foreign keys are also defined, which, you know, has to do with these lines. And normalization, which is something we're not going to talk about for two weeks. Uh, if I did normalization today, everybody would cry and quit. So it wouldn't be cool. Then after you've done the logical, there's one step after that. Then you color in your drawing. When by that I mean, depending on how you, what your target audience is, you use different colors or different kinds of coloring, you know, markers, pencils, uh, charcoals, you know, whatever else you happen to be using. Um, a physical diagram is specific to the database server you're using. So in other words, if you're using MySQL, what it expects is different than, say, what Postgres or Oracle would expect. So the physical diagram is specific to the target, where your data is actually going to reside in the end. Um, it'll have all the usual stuff, but instead of using the words entities and attributes, you're using tables and columns. Relationships are still there. You may actually do some denormalization at this point once you realize that you overly normalized. Um, physical considerations may, may actually make your diagram significantly different than logical one. Based on what your server is capable of, you may need to do things a little different. Um, and it will be different for each database server like platform, not, you know, if you're running on six different versions of SQL Server, they're all pretty much the same. But if you're doing a, a design for SQL Server as opposed to Oracle, the data types are significantly different between them, how you define the relationships, what they do. Yes? It's, no, no, the, 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 uh, the conceptual diagram is if you're drawing something, first you'll do an outline which basically sketches out roughly what you're going to draw. And then the logical is you've pretty much drawn in all the major details, and then the physical is where you color it in. Okay, here. That's going to be a face. If you've never drawn, those of you that have actually learned how to draw know this is how you draw a face. Now, I'm going to put in some eyes, because I really suck at drawing. I'm going to put a nose and a mouth. However, my face is proportional, because I put in my sketch. Now you get rid of the lines. And you've got one punch man. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, get that joke, well, that's too bad. But at this point, it's now a logical. As in, I've put in all the major features. But there's maybe specific things that I need to do, and then I color it in. And then at that point, I'm making it specific to the target audience. That, that's basically the conceptual. As in, this is the concept of a face. Now we're going to draw in the details. And then once you color it in, that means you're actually making it specific to the server. You know, SQL Server may not like you using pastels. Oracle wants you to use uh, crayons because it's special that way. You know, def depending on what you're planning to use, you know, how you, you fill in the details will be different. You'll actually probably use different diagramming software even, unless you're using specific packages that support more than one server. So, I mean, it's like you're filling in details. Um, that is what it is. Does that make a little bit of sense? 
Okay. Now, I'm going to do some terminology next. The first couple of lectures in this course are really brutal for this stuff. But the next couple of slides will cover 90% of your needs for this course and probably their job afterwards. Um, often, depending what industry you're in, the terminology, uh, terminology changes. If you've ever worked in, with uh, GIS systems, some of your database tech terminology is not going to be the same as a data architect's. Why? Because you're looking at the data in a different way, so you're not going to use the same words. Um, okay. The first one is entity or entity type. Those two are used interchangeably depending what book you're looking at, as in what textbook you look at, they'll use one or the other. They mean the same thing. An entity represents a thing. So if you want to, we can add a nat last slash on the end there and say thing. But we never call it thing in the industry. It's an entity. But it's a thing. It could be anything. You're a thing, you're a thing, you're a thing. You know, everybody in here is a thing. We're all humans. Therefore, that's at the entity type where we're defining a human as a type. This room is a thing. Your laptop is a thing. These desks are a thing. These light bulbs are a thing. All these projectors are a thing. The weather outside is a thing. The fact that we're in class at 3 o'clock is a thing. So you know that you know that, that, old, that phrase that was floating around, it's actually kind of dying off finally? Well, that was a thing. Well, literally, it's a thing. Even a concept is a thing. So essentially, it represents a thing. It's an entity. Now, as I just said, we're all humans, I hope. Then maybe there's a lizard person in here. I don't know. But, you know, I'm assuming we're all humans. Um, based on that, I'm going to keep going. However, so that an entity is a thing. However, a unique version of that thing is an instance. In other words, I've defined in here humans. I am an instance of a human. You're an instance of a human. I hope you're an instance of a human. But we're all individual instances of the same thing. Now we have, in a minute I'll talk about attributes. However, we're all essentially the same thing, technically. Once we go high level enough when we talk about entities, we're all roughly the same thing. Whether we're male, female, you know, you speak Punjabi, I speak French, speak Polish, whatever other language you happen to speak. You know, whatever language you speak, it has nothing to do with the fact that you're, it's just you're human and that's an attribute of the language you speak, so that's in a bit. So an instance is a single moment or a single individual representation of a thing. So when you want to talk about classrooms, just look at this building. There's what, 75, 80 rooms in this building alone, at least probably almost 100. And technically those are all rooms. So a room is a type. T119 is an instance of a room. T117 is a different instance of a room. That is an instance. So it's a single m entity and a single representative piece of data that represents that thing. Now, when we were still talking about entities, because might as well stick to entities while we're in that zone, a strong entity is an entity that's not dependent on another entity. Now, that sounds like a really dumb phrase. However, essentially, if we look in here, each of us are strong entities, technically. You guys all have student numbers. I have an employee number. We have a primary key that uniquely identifies us. At least I'm hoping we're all strong entities in this room because I'm going to talk about weak entities next. And essentially, when a strong entity exists, it can be identified onto itself, by itself, without needing something else to, to prove what it is. So, for example, each of you have a student number. As a student, you're individually strong entities. As humans, if we just go at that level, it gets a little harder. But we're still technically strong entities because we all have a unique chunk of DNA. Right? So if we really want to abstract all the way out, you know, we're all strong entities because we can all be uniquely identified one way or another. 
However, there are things out there that cannot be uniquely identified and they depend on the existence of a strong entity. Like that guy who can't live without his girlfriend. He cannot exist without his defining significant other. I know someone like that. It's kind of sad because he's related to me, but not me. <laughs> Just saying, not me. <laughs> Definitely not me. <laughs> but, you know, we all know someone like that. But however, in the real world, something like that would be more like your receipt, a receipt from the store. You know when you, get, you go to the grocery store and you buy yourself four pounds of bananas. I don't know why you're eating four pounds of bananas in one go, but just bought yourself four pounds of bananas. I guess you love bananas. You just bought yourself a bag of apples and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at your receipt, there's a list of items that you bought. Those items, like a, what identifies one four-pound bag of bananas over a different four-pound bag of bananas? They're all the same. They all have the same SKU, 4011. The weight identifies the difference. However, honestly, what's the difference between one banana and the other banana? None. The fact that you bought those bananas and it's been attached to your receipt makes that batch of bananas unique. But they cannot be unique unless you have your, your receipt to prove that they're yours. So they're weak. They cannot exist as an item you can buy or bought without the fact that you actually bought it. So that's a weak entity. Normally, it'll have a partial key. In other words, if you have your receipt, you'll have your receipt number, and I usually have a receipt on me, or I have one on the screen, but I completely forgot to grab a recent one. But when you look at a, your receipt, you'll always have a transaction code and a cashier code, and a bunch of codes at the top. So that is your order, and each item in your order is usually a compound key. In other words, the 4011 that identifies bananas, plus the order number, allows it to be identifiable. Without the order number, 4011 identifies the fact that bananas exist. Outside that 4011, it means nothing. Because the bananas is just a stack of bananas at the grocery store until it's been added to your receipt. Thus, it's a weak entity as far as that's concerned. Um, and it uses what's called identifying relationships. I'll be talking to those in a bit. Um, but essentially, they cannot be identified without, well, essentially, something to help identify, which in this case is a, a receipt number or an order number. Does that make sense, roughly? Right? So if you want to remember about weak entities, you just think about the receipts of the bananas or the guy that can't live without his girlfriend. Either way, you're going to be right. I'm, I, did you notice I'm not flipping it the other way around? Because I got in trouble last time I did. So... Okay, now we're gonna, remember I said I was going to talk about attributes. Now we're going to talk about attributes. We spoke about what an entity is, what an instance of an entity is, and the two kinds of entities you'll find out there, the weak and the strong. However, what is an entity without its attributes? In other words, what's the point of having an entity if you can't describe this entity? So for example, you got someone, and at this point it's really hard to use, it's really going to be a hard one to to visualize. Imagine if you were blind. Well, just go with me here for a second. Imagine you're completely blind. Or even now, if I were to close my eyes and tell you I'm holding a thingamajigger in my hand and I don't give you any way to identify what a thingamajigger is, how would you know what this thingamajigger is? Or a doodad or a gizmo. Pick your favorite little, you know, fill in the word, stupid word item. But if I were sitting here and instead of, you know, what we know as a box, I'm holding this thing in my hand. And I say I'm holding a uh, doohickey. Doohickey makes noise. Well, actually, that's an attribute. It's making noise. However, if I were to hold it like this and you closed your eyes and I told you I'm holding a doohickey, how would you know what it is? You can't. You cannot physically know what it is. Thus, we have to use attributes. Now, an attribute is used to describe an entity. Now let's go back to us being humans. What are a few examples of attributes we could apply to humans? And, you know, whatever comes to mind, you feel free to use. Though usually the first one I use is sex. But that one's getting really complicated. So, you know, it's getting a little harder to use that as my primary example. 
right? So if we're just going to go with biological, biological sex, you go male, female, plus miscellaneous. But basically you got the two. And then after that, you can choose other attributes after that. For example, you could go name, date of birth. Yeah, address, phone number, examples. Um, but if I was trying to abstract a little bit because you're homeless, you don't have an address, well, that's... Yeah, I'm, going, I'm trying to go keep up at the higher level here, the most basics. So at the most basic level, you've got, you know, sex, height, weight, eh? Number of limbs. Theoretically, yes, if you want to describe a human. How many limbs do we have? Um... I'm glad you used limbs. <laughs> Just saying, if you use the word appendage, that's different. Right? But, see when I was talking about me not being politically correct? Um, but, for example, you've got a date of birth. You've got, you know, insert sex here. You've got height. You've got weight. Um, you've got, you know, number of limbs. Eye color would be another attribute you could use to describe a human. However, you know, these are all the attributes. But when, I, when you're starting to deal with all the different attributes, you should be picking the attributes that are cohesive to what you actually need. For example, when you applied to be a student at the college, did they ask you what eye color? No, they don't care. We don't care. We just want to know how much money you can give us. I'm, I'm kidding. There's more to it than that, but, you know. Essentially, you have to pick data to apply. So what do they care about when you apply to the school? They want your name. They want an identifying number of some sort. If you're a Canadian citizen, guess what it is? It's your SIN number. Uh, actually, if you're an American citizen, we'll take your, uh, your SSN number too, your social security number. Um, if you're a foreign exchange student, usually we want your passport and or visa, a student visa number, or usually both. We want to know your name. We want to know your, your home address, your mailing address. Where are you going to live while you're in Ottawa? Three different addresses, potentially. Um, they'll want to know, you know your date of birth so they know how old you are because it's kind of important. Um, they probably want to know as a basic identifying criteria. Those are the basics we use to identify a student. A person's name, a unique identifier, where do they live? Phone number or two, email address. And that would be the basics. That would cover identifying a student. In other words, the fact that, you know, your eyes are green as opposed to blue means absolutely nothing as far as the school is concerned. So we're not going to ask it of you. They ask you a few other questions depending on, you know, what kind of program are you going into. If you were going into grades, they may not care about your math scores. If you're going to computers, they certainly as tech care about your, your math scores. Why? Because computers kind of have to do with math, <laughs> just a little. Um, so when you're picking out your attributes, you want to pick stuff that's cohesive to what you need. I mean, we could honestly spend a ton of time just describing a human. Number of limbs versus number of appendages. What hair color do they have? What's their natural hair color as opposed to the applied color? It's actually funny because I don't have a single person here with unique hair color. I think it's the first time I've had where I didn't have somebody in here with they have green, blue, red, purple hair. Oh, sorry, I didn't notice you. Damn, right in front of me too because I've been looking right above your head. So, okay, we got somebody with a slight unique add-on to her hair. Some, some highlights. That's okay. Sorry, I've, I looked right over your head. That's bad. Um, but, you know, I'm just saying, you know, th those are things the school doesn't care about, so why would we even collect that information? Hair color is transient anyways. It can be whatever color you want it to be, within or, uh, pretty much any color you want it to be now. So it's not information that's cohesive to a student. Um, on the other hand, if we were doing a police profile for someone, they'd probably ask, what's the person's eye color? What's, you know... What's their skin tone? You know, do they speak with an accent? What accent do they have? Do they have any ink on their body? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How many, do they have piercings, no piercings? Those are questions the college would never ask, but a police profile service where they're trying to sketch up a person, they probably care about. 
depending on what you're trying to do, your attributes are going to change. Then you have required versus optional attributes. A required attribute means for an entity instance to exist in our system, a, we must have that value. For example, at the school, we must have a first name and a last name. So as I've discovered this term, this is the first term I've ever had like this. I've had a few students that don't have a last name. They have a first name. And in one person's case, their last name is period. Literally, they put a dot in the system to put their last name in. Because that's just how it's done in their country, where they don't actually put in both names. I, I was shocked. As a North American, that was an unthinkable item. But hey, I learned something, you know, 44, and I just learned something this last week. I was amazed. But as you can see, our systems are designed for people with a first name and a last name, so they really care. So sometimes they have to get creative, so they put in your name in twice. Or they put in a period <laughs> as one of your two names. So those are required attributes, as in we require two names. An optional attribute could be cell phone number. Yeah, as if nobody in here doesn't have a cell phone. But there once was a time where a cell phone number was an optional attribute, as in not everybody had a cell phone. And so even now, that's still an optional attribute, because a lot of people don't even have a home phone number anymore. They only have a cell phone. So which one becomes the optional number? So a lot of systems, you'll notice, they change the word from home phone to primary phone number. Secondary phone number, and secondary phone number could be optional because not everybody has two phone numbers. So that's the difference between a, a required and an optional. Another required they may have is, you know, your address while you live, not necessarily where you live in Ottawa, but your home address. So where are you registering from? They, usually that's something they want. Uh, the school usually wants to know where you're living in Ottawa, but I don't know if I'm going to have any students in this group, but I've had cases where I've had a student change address every month. It's not like he's telling he was telling the school where he was living every single time he changed couches. But he basically couch surfed through an entire term. So, you know. Okay, second time, a uh, second slide about attributes. Simple versus composite. A simple attribute is an atomic piece of data. It cannot be broken down further. For example, and I know people are going to argue with me about this. Usually I get one of those people every term. Your date of birth. Your date of birth is your date of birth, end of story. Yeah, we could break down by day, month, year, but the database has a date type, so we wouldn't break it down. Date of birth is what it is. A composite attribute would be your address. Well, if you just use the phrase, what is your address? Or what is your full address? You'll have the street, the city, your political distributed division of your whatever way your country breaks it down. Uh, usually a postal code of some sort and the name of a country. But as we refer to it, it's just your address. What's your mailing address? 123 Sum Street, Ottawa, Ontario, K1K, 1Z1, Canada. That is a composite attribute. It's more made up of multiple pieces. Now, at the conceptual and logical levels, ish, at the local, logical one, they can exist as is. You put in the word address, people know it's an address. When you get to the physical design, it must be broken down to its pieces. For example, if you lived on Cobden Street and you need to find everybody who lives in the town of Cobden, and if it was a single entry, you couldn't search just for that specific piece. And I'm using that as an example because I don't know if anybody around from the Ottawa Valley in here. So I've used the word Cobden, so at least two people in here know what Cobden is. An hour, an hour up the highway, this little town by a lake that's, you know, you blink and you miss it except for its great brewery. Uh, Farmer's Daughter's beer is fantastic. <laughs> yes, I got three people nodding now. They go, exactly, they know exactly what I'm talking about now. <laughs> there you go. That's where my wife's family's from. Ish. <laughs> They're transplanted to Pembroke. No, not, well, data types is later. But it's the different pieces, as in it can be broken down into uh, smaller pieces easily. 
An email address, it's, it's a one piece. Uh, no, email not comp uh, com uh, is not a composite item unless you insist on tracking the person's user and their domain separately. But normally, email address is an email address. It's complete unto itself. An address is not complete unto it's, it's, comp it's, it's made up of more than one thing. So often you'll see other items where when you order from certain catalogs, they'll literally have like two different codes. They'll have like a, like a three-digit code, then a dash, and then like five numbers. As far as you're concerned, that's a complete product code, but maybe at IKEA, the first three digits mean something different than the last five digits. The first three digits could be a product line, the last five digits is the actual item itself. Yes? Exactly. So if we say name, what is your name? That'd be a composite data type uh, and attribute. Beca well, unless you only have one name. But, you know, for, for myself, being, you know, French Catholic, or was, still French, but having been born and raised French Catholic, that means I've got two first names, a middle name, and a last name. All French Catholics' first name is Joseph. Automatically, technically I'm a Joe, but I'm not. Then there's Daniel, then there's my middle name, then there's my last name. And, you know, that is a full name. And if you're Hispanic, it's a little longer than that. You know, depending where you're in the world, the name changes, the length of the name changes. But in most parts of the world, it's a composite attribute. And depending on your data needs, leaving it as a composite attribute is okay. But some other places, even at the college, we like having a first name and a last name because we often search by last name. So you want to break it down to its smallest component pieces. In this case, you have first name, middle name, last name, or first name, middle initial, last name. That's another good example of a composite depending on your data use target. All right, now, now that we've talked about single versus composite, right? Simple versus composite. We've got the other side of it where we have single valued versus multi-valued. Single valued is easy to understand. What is your date of birth? Guess what you don't have? More than one date of birth. Trust me, you popped out of your mother only once, right? It only happened one time, and I don't care how, many how much you think you're special, it only happened once. Everybody only has one date of birth. Therefore, it's a single-valued attribute. It cannot have more than one possible value. A multi-valued list, on the other hand, is what's called a repeating group. For example, if I say, what schools did you attend, or attended schools as an attribute? Now, if we go back and we start looking at all the schools you attended, you and that would be a multi-valued list. Although depending on where you're from, you know, you might have gone to a K-13 and you spent your entire life in one school. In your case, it's still only one entry. But in my case, if I go back and go, you know, Canada, KDHS, Andre Carey, Sacré-Cœur, Imec de Conception. Now that's five schools I went through to get here. And depending on, you know, where you're from, one or more schools may have applied to you in your life. But that's still the schools I attended, so it's a multi, it's a list. But at the conceptual level, even at the logical level, we just want to know it's a list of schools you attended. When it's time to go to the physical diagram at the end, that gets broken down and converted to its own entity because you can't have multi-valued attributes in a database. Well, you can, but it's stupid. Just saying, you can do it, but it's a really dumb idea to do. Because it's impossible to search, it's impossible to maintain, and somebody's gonna screw up and you're gonna lose lots of data. So as part of the database design process, a multi-valued attribute will become its own entity or its own table. In other words, instead of saying schools attended, it would be another entity called, you know, schools that you attended or whatever you want to call it. But instead of being just in one entry, like if I went,
If I said, right now, if I went, blah, 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 my list of schools I attended. And so right now, that is a multi-valued attribute. In other words, it's a single entry that has a list of values inside of it. When we get down to it later, it gets broken down into its own entity. That means that there'd be each of these are separate instance. And at that point, you guys are probably thinking, well, what's the difference between this and this? These all exist onto themselves. These are all in the same thing. It's all one piece. Um, so, well, that's, that's, about, that's about it, actually. There's not much more I can say about that. When, when it's time later, you'll start, when you start designing databases, you may hit something like this. Then you'll, you'll you know, ask me about it, and we'll clarify it again. But essentially, if you have a list, eventually it turns into an entity of its own. That's all there is to it. Lists cannot exist onto themselves. Okay. Attributes, some more information about them. Now, there's two, let's call them meta types of attributes. There's not actually an actual word for this, but you got stored versus derived. Now, a stored attribute is easy to understand. Your name is stored, as in we take it, we put it in the database, end of story. Your address, your email address, those are stored, they go in, end of story, your SIN number, passport number, whatever. It goes into the database, it's self-contained onto itself. Fantastic. Those are easy. A derived attribute is something that can be calculated. So in other words, if you can calculate the value you don't normally store it. These will exist at the conceptual level and often at the logical level, but once you get to the physical level, those go away for a few different reasons. Um, usually for performance. Because every time you have something that's calculated and you update the record, you have to recalculate it. So you're just adding a little bit of overhead. Now, the, my p favorite example for this is your age versus your date of birth. Your date of birth is your date of birth. It's not gonna change. Contrary to what some people believe, your date of birth does not change. The only people that we can really argue about their date of birth is, you know, leap year babies. And even that, they still, you know, their date of birth is their date of birth. However, your age can be calculated. Therefore, how do you calculate somebody's age? Today, minus their date of birth, tells you how old they are. Right? Age can be calculated. Why would you ever update? Imagine every single night we had to run a batch job that updated the age inside of a database. Why would the heck would you do that when you can calculate it on the fly? In other words, you're storing an age column and every single night you have to look at everybody who was born on that date and add a year to them. It's just pointless. Um, another example of a derived attribute would be a line total. Now, some of you don't know what a line total is. When you go to the store and you buy four pounds of bananas at 97 cents a pound, a line total would be four times 97 cents equals some magic number, right? And that magic number is calculated. Normally, you wouldn't store that unless you're like re dealing with really big amounts of data. Like Amazon, they're going to store that. Why? Because they deal with, you know, umpteenth terabytes of data a day. Now, a website like T-Turtle, on the other hand, will not store the line totals. Why? Why would they bother? Uh, we would they even store taxes, because taxes are calculable, right? They store what percent of tax was applied, but they won't store the actual tax itself. They calculate it when they show it to you on screen. It's a one-time calculation as opposed to, you know, constantly calculating. So those are derived attributes. In other words, attributes that can be defined by a mathematical equation is not st is a derived attribute. Yes. 
<coughs> well, technically, you know, you got a piece of math that tells you what the line total is. So if you can figure out the value of one attribute based on the values of other attributes, that's a calculation. Therefore, you that's an uh, that's derived. If a, an attribute cannot be calculated based on other attributes, it then stored. In other words, quantity is stored. Item price is stored. Item price times quantity minus discount is a calculated value, so it's derived. Anything you can calculate or any column you can def or any attribute you can define as an equation of parts of another of parts of another part of the database, those are derived. And you usually don't store them because well you don't store them. Well, that's, for example, you look, when's the last time you bought something on Amazon? Oh, not Amazon. Okay, you went to the, you went to the grocery store and you bought yourself some snacks. Okay. Or you went to McDonald's and you bought yourself uh, five McDoubles. Right, they're going to McDoubles, quantity five, I had a buck, I had a buck 49. I think I think it's more than that now in 179. So 5 times 179 is your line total. It's math. Anything you can express as a mathematical equation and all the parts are contained within the database is derived. Do you have a question? I saw the big pause for a second. <laughs> That, that, that's also derived. You wouldn't store that because you can calculate it based on information that's stored in the database. Yes? Uh, usually that's when they get to the point where you start talk, talk about denormalizing a database or you optimize a database for performance. Usually you try to avoid storing anything that's derived because that means at some point you'll probably have to recalculate it. However, if you're dealing with data sets the size of, say, Loblaws or Amazon, Walmart. The amount of data they push through their systems and they give pay, they don't want to have to keep recalculating your total every time you look at your order. I ordered that on Amazon yesterday. Oh, I'm going to go look at that total of my order I bought again. Oh, it's got to recalculate my total. Now, if it did that for the billion people doing the same thing at the same time, the server's going to drop to its knees. So in their case, yes, they're going to store the derived attributes for performance reasons. Unless you need to store it for performance reasons, no, don't store it. So they can become stored, but they're still considered derived attributes, but they're stored derived attributes. And I try to stay away from that because it gets a little blurry. Okay, this is a transition slide. Attributes five, keys part one. Now, Identifier, identifier attributes are also known as keys. They're made up of one or more attributes, and if they're made up of more than one attribute, they're known as compound keys. Now, an identifier attribute would be, in Canada, your SIN number, right? Your social insurance number. Your passport number would be a unique identifier. Or at the school, take a guess what your identifying attribute is at the school once you've been registered. Yeah, your student number. Right, you're, you all have a student number. That is, as far as the school's concerned, that is who you are, you're a number. The fact that, you know, the name next to number may change, because it can, whether your name's a period or something else, or they misspelt your name, or their name field wasn't long enough to hold your name, I've seen that. I've seen somebody who had a French last name with a hyphenated um, Indian last name. And it was like one of the really long Indian last names that had like 20-something letters, 20-some odd letters in it. And the system actually cut off like the last three letters of their name. So that kind of sucked for them because their name was never right. <laughs> Just saying. I think that's been fixed. But that was a problem at one point where your name could be too long. So your name is not an identifying attribute. 
Uh, for example, and you know, people say, Dan, you're racist when I say this, Muhammad. Sorry, that's not a unique name. Or Singh as a last name is not a unique name. You cannot use that as a unique identifier. But you do have some sort of unique identifier, so that is your identifying attribute. It's an identifier attribute. So your SIN number, your student number, your passport number, those are identifying the things that can be used to identify you. Um, depending on where you're from or what you were required to give to the school, passport numbers actually overlap. Comes as a shock, but you know, most countries just use numbers for their passport numbers. There's no letters mixed into it. And when you come from a country where, you know, what you call a small town is like half the population of Canada, th their, your passport numbers are really, really long. So odds are somebody in your country has the same number as somebody in Canada has the same passport number. An American student may have the same passport number as, you know, someone from China, theoretically. And that's not always enough. So sometimes you need that plus, say, your student visa number. Because usually the, do the official documentation you get has a unique number on it to identify it. So the school will sometimes use both of those together to as a composite key. As in, if this is your passport number and this is your student visa number put together, that uniquely identifies you as far as the school is concerned. But if you're a Canadian student and it's a SIN number, congratulations, you got only one of those. So, as a rule of thumb, you try to avoid composite, ad composite keys or composite identifiers because things get a little weird. Because in theory, you could still have one half that's unique and one half that's not unique. And bad things can happen at that point. Uh, only if you include the country code. Now, how many people in here have had a different phone number in the last four years? Is it unique now? Is it, can I, can I use your number from, say, two numbers ago to find you now? So, yeah, that's not a good identifier. That's why we don't use phone numbers and identify. We'll use it as a lookup value, which is different than an identifier. It's something we can search on as opposed to something that uniquely identifies you. So... There you go. That, I love, that's, I usually, I usually have one student that calls up the phone number. You were the winner this time. But it, for example, yeah, for, that's a really good example, right? You can't use that as a unique identifier because it's not necessarily unique. Heck, for a long time, I kept getting somebody else's phone calls on my cell because I got a recycled phone number. You know, my daughter actually had a cell phone number for someone who had the same name as her. First name as her, which was amazing. They kept calling and saying, can I speak to Karina? Speaking. Are you yes, I'm sure. I think you're talking to the wrong Karina. Well, it's funny because they were looking for Karina from like the Caribbean, which apparently had her number before she had that phone number. It was really hilarious, actually, for the longest time. Yes. Can be anything. Yeah, and email's pretty unique as far as it's concerned. Then again, how many people here have more than one email address? How many of you have actually changed email addresses or email providers just because you got tired of the spam? There we go. Okay, so can that be used as unique? For a single site, yes. Could that be used as a way to find you amongst a pile uniquely? No, because it can change. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm just saying it's not guaranteed to always be unique. Therefore, it's not a good idea to use as an identifier. If, when you start talking about, which is actually what this slide here is actually about, about candidate keys versus primary keys. Now, That's actually a fluke because there's a Daniel Goudreau in Quebec, Montreal, that has almost the exact same email address as me except without the dot. And I get, I get his hotel bookings all the time. So I call and get them canceled. 
<laughs> Actually, I called to tell them that you know, it's the wrong email address, but just saying. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. So it's not a good identifier. So candidate and primary keys. Candidate keys, actually hang on, the composite keys actually left over from the previous slide, so let's ignore that. Candidate keys are keys that uniquely identify each row in a relation. So when you want to talk about a relation, substitute the word relation for a table or entity. It's the same thing. So Candidate keys are a thing that can be used to uniquely identify you. Now, I use the SIN number as a good example. That's a candidate key. As in, we can use that normally to uniquely identify someone, at least you know, if you're talking about Canadian data only. Now, the primary key is the candidate key that's actually chosen to be the unique identifier. And in a few minutes, I'll, I'll talk about whether or not natural keys versus synthetic keys. And I'll discuss why SIN numbers are a really bad idea to use. But essentially, after you've identified all the potential ways you can uniquely identify an instance, so in other words, each of us are an instance, and after I look at all the different things that make up a potential student, I choose a combination of information that allows me to uniquely identify someone so that that combination of entries or attributes will always be unique. Yes? The identifier. So as we were discussing, right, she was discussing about using email address, you know, or phone number. These are things as you're doing the design process, you're like, can I use this a unique identifier? Can I not use this? Oh, that should be fairly unique. You know, for example, Leon's furniture. They use your phone number as your identifier. Just saying. Unless you're like me, who's had the same phone number, like home phone number for over 20 years. If you've got a cell phone, you know, my son's changed numbers three times because he got tired and he kept, kept dropping his old cell phone number for whatever reason. But, you know, his number is not constant, so he has to remember all his old phone numbers so that when they go look them up, they, they find it based on whatever. So those are candidate keys, once you've finally chosen the unique set, that becomes a primary key. So how do you choose your identifiers? As I've actually covered most of this already, you want to choose identifiers that will not change in value ever. Phone numbers change, email addresses change, addresses change. SID numbers usually don't change. But even that's becoming not so safe. Passport numbers. They change every single time you renew your passport. Therefore, not a guarantee. So depending on what you do, they may change. You want to pick something that is not null. As in, you don't want to ha give, use an identifier that may be empty, like last name, apparently, or first name, depending which way you want to swing that one. So if it's possible that they won't give you the value, you can't use it as an identifier because it's optional. Avoid intelligent identifiers. In other words, these are things that contain a location. For example, you could have used a a code, you, use a, you create your own little code and you say, for example, Ottawa Dash. And, you know, every single time you want to look up someone, you have to start with Ottawa. Which was fine, because Ottawa hasn't changed names. Anybody here remember something called Hull? Though, though most of you from not around here don't remember Hull. Hull is what Gatineau used to be called. Before they amalgamated, instead of keeping it Hull, they decided to call it Gatineau. They changed the name. Um, you know, when, or actually another good example is when you drive up the highway a little bit, you know, you had Pembroke, you had Petawawa, and you had a bunch of, you no know, no two-bit nothings on the other side. Now it's called Laurentian Hills. The regional municipality of Laurentian Hills. 
Yay. Everybody still calls it Petawawa <laughs> or Deep River. But, you know, technically it's Laurentian Hills. Just like here in Ottawa, Canada, even though we all know it as Canada, it's not Canada, it's Ottawa. Right? So don't use intelligent identifiers because obviously name of places change. People's names change. The name of things change. So don't try to get clever. Um, another thing about identifiers is try to use the simplest key humanly possible. Don't get fancy for comp complex composite keys. For example, if I wanted to really identify someone, I could say, what is your passport number? What is your country of origin? What is the postal code in your country? There's a pretty good chance that will work, unless you're from Yugoslavia, because your country doesn't exist anymore. It's now, what, last I heard, like five different countries? All the size of PEI, if that. But, you know, your country's changed name, so even that's no good. So you want to substitute to the smallest subset of information that uniquely identifies someone. Which leads me to surrogate keys, also known as synthetic keys. Depending on what textbook you look at, those two are the same thing. A surrogate key is the answer to all the problems, literally. It is a column that has a unique value that is assigned by the database server. That means it's not human dependent. And every single time you add an instance in the database, also known as a row, it gets a new value. That value no longer does not change for the lifetime of that row. So the database does server doesn't gives it the value, it never changes. They're very short. In other words, it's usually a number. Microsoft SQL Server is kind of weird. It gives you two different options for that. One's really short numeric, and the other one's what's called a guide idea, GUID. GUID stands for Globally Unique Identifier. And it's long and totally not identifiable. Surrogate keys are ideal as a primary key. Why? Because they have no meaning outside the database server. On the out, to the outside world. For example, if your passport number is 1234 and mine's 1234, we got overlap. But if I say your ID is 6 and my ID is 7, and 6 and 7 can never be used again because they've been given out, that solves that problem. It's always unique. In a few minutes, I'll be talking about the difference between surrogate keys and natural keys. Um, and you'll see a lot about my points at that, on that. All right, a foreign key. It's an attribute that is the, a key of more than one relation. In other words, I have an employee number. It is something something three seven. You gotta be careful, right? Something something three seven. And in the system, the Algonquin College system recognizes that as my unique identifier. Now, the rest of you all have a number we start with 040, then a bunch of other digits. That is your key. Now, when you talk about a, a course enrollment, on that course enrollment, you'll have the teacher's unique identifier, something something 37, and you'll have one of your student numbers to show that we're both enrolled at the same time in this course. So it'll be a row for each of you, and that one row will show that I'm your teacher, that's, you're the student, and this is the course you're taking. We're not gonna copy your name and my name into that. Why would you bother? Because one of the goals of the database is to avoid duplicate data. You would just copy your primary, co uh, copy the value of your primary key in, and that's your foreign key. Once we start designing it, this will make more sense. Just saying, it will. Um, it's hard to really visualize until you've actually played with the data. Uh, but essentially a foreign key is a way for one row to be related to another row via one column. So they share values between the two. Um, if, go back to using phone numbers as a key, I don't like that one, but that's the easiest one for people to grasp. At home, wherever your home may be, not the home, you know, where 
you're, you grew up. Let's go with that. And you had a phone, because most people had a phone. At that home, if you use the phone number to uniquely identify that home, everybody, so that home has a phone number, 555-1212. Each of you could have that as your foreign key. In other words, you lived at that address, so we can find you by the phone number. So each of you had 555-1212 attached to you, or whatever it is applicable in your home country. 555-1212 is directory lookup in Canada, in case you're ever curious. It's what we used to call 411. But if you, you had that number that belonged to your household, that was a foreign key on to you saying you could be identified by that phone number because you lived at that address. That's a foreign key. In other words, your address has one single phone number, so that's a primary record, and you have a related record. Each person that lived there had was related, and we could have related it using the phone number. It's kind of a stretch, but it's really hard to explain the concept without actual visuals to, to do that. Okay, lots of text, wall of text. I talk about the surrogate versus natural keys. And I have a few pieces of terminology on here. Some of this I've already covered. Uh, some of these slides were built up from other slides over the years and, you know, terminology stuck around. And actually all of these have all almost been defined except for two. The, the one is a natural key. A key that's a form of attributes that already exist in the real world. SSN number, SIN number, passport numbers, those are things ex that exist already in the real world. It's not guaranteed to be true that it's always unique, but it's pretty close. Um, American, for example, American SSN numbers aren't the same size as a Canadian SIN number. Depending what part of the world you're from, your unique government issued number, whatever it is that they use where you're from, if they use one, you know, is going to be unique within that country to you or to political division, whatever, however they decide to break it down. It can be used as a natural key, assuming for a few issues. One, privacy laws. Not, not, not all countries are you allowed to store a person's social security number. Unless you have very specific reasons, you have to follow certain rules. You may, cho may choose not to. And another issue I'll discuss in a minute, uh, but actually I'll bring it up now. SIN numbers. They used to be... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Inviolate. In other words, you were given your SIN number, you could never change for your lifetime. You can now get a new SIN number in Canada. Anybody want to take a guess why you're now allowed to change your SIN number? It's not easy to do it. Well, you can do it. What? No. No, they, they don't give a shit about that. They did just too bad. No, identity theft is actually, a, eh? Too bad. TFB. Uh, fill in with your favorite F word in the middle of TFB. No, the, one of the big reasons, and actually the only via valid reason so far in Canada for you to change your SIN number is identity theft. Somebody gets a copy of your SIN number, they start to impersonate you, they rack up tons of debt, and your SIN number is now out in the wild, and at that point you're allowed to apply for a new SIN number. You're essentially rebooting your entire existence in Canada. That's why they don't like giving you a new SIN number. Because Revenue Canada has to go through and change all your tax returns from, you know, from now until you were 18, and their system's really old, and that takes a long time, and things break. Um, you know, your credit history is gone. So you have to actually go through with the credit agencies and prove who you are for each of the transactions. The banks are going to hate you a lot, especially if you're a TD, because they suck. The data systems are terrible. Just saying, you know, there's, there's things. Um, so, so are natural keys are iffy under the best circumstances. Synthetic keys are also known as surrogate keys. As I described it, it's a key that has no business meaning. It's a unique number generated by the database. It has no meaning outside the database. All right. 
Issues with natural keys. Number one, the primary key size. Surrogate keys don't have problems with size because they're usually a number. An integer is small. It doesn't take up a lot of room. If you end up having to have a primary key that is your phone number with your last name, if you have a last name, and your postal code, that's a big key. The database server has to do multiple lookups to find that. An integer is the smallest thing. Foreign key size. If your primary key is big, your foreign keys are going to be big too because it all has to be copied. So if you're using three pieces of data to uniquely identify someone, on the child record, all three pieces of data need to be there also. That sucks. Uh, especially if somebody gets married and they change their last name. Right? And things start compounding and your data goes south. Aesthetics. All right. It's an eye of the beholder thing. I can guarantee a surrogate key is a lot more visually pleasing to a programmer, not, not to the people looking at it on the outside, but to a programmer, an integer is a beautiful thing. Because it's small and easy to understand. Five is a lot easier to understand than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, dash, G. It's gross when you have to start dealing with really long digits. Whereas, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, dash, G might be the very first record in the database. As opposed to a synthetic key, which the first record would be one. Optionality and applicability. Oh, that's a hard word to say. Four and five. Surrogate keys have no problem with the fact that you may not want to give your SIN number. Surrogate keys don't care. They don't even exist outside the database. But some people may not want to provide information. Sovereign domain, I refuse to acknowledge your government. You may not have my SIN number because I don't have one. As stupid as that is. All the time. Uh, it's people that decide to live in a country but pretend they don't belong to that country. It's a thing. Feel free to look it up when you have time. But essentially, some people may not want to give out their SIN number. Insert reason here why, but they don't want to give out their SIN number. And if you're using that as your primary key, you can't identify them. That means their record can't go into the database. That means that natural keys can never be optional. What happens to the person, let's say you wrote it, you got clever and you wrote your entire database system using the person's SIN number as your primary key. And suddenly you have someone from China show up to register into your system and they don't have a Canadian SIN number. Well, I guess you can't be my customer. I don't want your money. Actually, I always want your money. When you, work in, when you start working in business, you always want the person's money. That's how you, you know, the world works. So if it's optional as in the person can refuse to give it to you, then it's not a good choice. Okay, now, uniqueness. Although this line's a little strange, the way it's worded. Um, this is actually referring to surrogate keys. Surrogate keys are always 100% guaranteed to be unique because the database server hands them out. For example, your student number here at the school, when you register and the system accepts your registration, you get your student number right away. It's not some person in the back going, oh, the next number is 56. The system goes, okay, you're 0401234567. The next person is 0401234567. Blah, blah, blah. It's automatically unique. Natural keys. Not always guaranteed to be unique, back to my passport example. My passport number might be the same as somebody else's passport number. Actually, at one point, I actually had a student in here whose passport number is only one digit different than mine. Trust me, we weren't from the same country. So you can't use always guarantee that to be unique. Same thing with phone numbers. 
You know, in North America, phone numbers are unique because we sh actually share the same country code. But when you start taking grabbing the digits for the UK, if you don't have the 044 at the beginning, for those of you that don't know, that's the dial code for the UK. The next set of digits potentially could be the same as a North American phone number. So, you know, they're not always guaranteed to be unique. Privacy. Another good one. Back to the SIN number. You have a guy who's a bit crooked and he starts collecting SIN numbers as he's going through people's records. Oh, that person's the same age as me. They go, oh, they're male. Okay, we're going to grab their SIN number because ah, I'm not going to do anything bad with that. But, you know, because they're there, they're visible. They have to be visible. So, storing at keys, on the other hand, don't have privacy concerns because they have absolutely no meaning. Zero zilch, no meaning outside the database server. Accidental denormalization. Um, again, you can't accidentally denormalize something that's not real. In the future, you may decide, oh, I've got people's names and we only need to have one field for name. And then you discover that you need to find people by last name. And you can't because some people's names are like Muhammad, Muhammad. Or you don't have a last name. Or insert other thing here. You know, there's reasons why when you start denormalizing the, you know, the data gets broken down again, suddenly you lose potential uniqueness. Um, cascading updates. I love this one. Uh, I once worked on a system, this was years ago, where they actually used people's last names as part of the primary key. Person didn't study database and call. Let's just say they, they were a self-taught database person. And they thought they were clever. I mean, it wasn't too bad. It was fairly unique. Uh, the biggest problem was is we once somebody got married and their last name changed. And in some parts of the world, it's the guy's name we change. So I'm not even being, I'm not even picking on one side or the other equation here. One of your two names change. And if you use the person's name as part of your primary key, guess what's going to happen? There's cascading updates. Says, and you've got to change the main record. Then you've got to roll down and fix the child records. The problem is you can't change the main record because the child records are invalid now. You can't change the child record because the main record's not valid either. So natural keys are a bad idea because of that. <coughs> the last one is join speeds. That's just technicalities. Let's just say you, if you want to go say, who in here has last, last two digits, their student number is 04, right? Somebody just moved their hand right away because they knew. Fast lookup. Instant lookup. Because that's that. Now, I, if I go and turn around and say, okay, well, I want to know everybody whose uh, sixth letter in their last name is R. Assuming you have a last name. Sixth letter in your last name is R. Actually, most of us actually have to sit there and count on our fingers until we hit the right letter. It's slower because we have to actually e examine every character in every position to match. So lookups are slow because of that. Now, you can't talk about the bads on one side without talking about, about the bads on the other. One of the biggest complaints people have about surrogate keys, and I'm talking, these are some of the old timer guys, is getting the next value, which is complete bullshit. Just saying. I censored it on the slide. I'm not going to censor it when I say it. It's complete crap. The database server gives it the next value. Almost all the database servers support automatic value incrementation of some sort, some way. MySQL does it automatically. Postgres and Oracle do it the same way. They have something called a sequence. It's a clicker. One, two, three, four, five. And you say, what's the next number? Oh, it's six. Click. What's the next number now? Seven. Click. Once they've handed out that number, it can never be handed out again. End of story. Yeah, there's no, that's not a, that's not a valid excuse. Users don't understand them. Who cares? They're not supposed to know what their unique number is. It's schools are the weird thing. Because you guys should, you may not know your student number right now, but I guarantee you by the end of this term, you're probably going to know your student number by heart. 551496 was mine when I was in college 22 years ago. Did you notice there wasn't a lot of digits on that? <laughs> my school was small. But I still remember my number. It's a unique number. It, at that school, they'll never hand out that number ever again. 
I know what it is. You guys know what your student number is. It's an, exam an example of one of the few times where a surrogate key makes sense. In most cases, you don't know what it is and you don't care. That you're going to look yourself up by name or by phone number or by some other piece of information anyways. So it's all good. Extra joins. That's rare. But, you know, if you're using these, uh, these natural keys that use people's names and stuff, you can skip trying to find the parent record and go right after the child record because you don't need to do a join because you've got all that information already. But honestly, the database servers are so fast nowadays that that's a moot point. Extra indexes. That is the only valid one we can argue about. Later in the term, I talk about what indexes are. Uh, but, they're, but as a short two-second thing, it's a way to make the database go faster when it's looking for things. And when you use a surrogate key, it adds one. So if you were indexing a person's, say, their SIN number, their last name, and their phone number, and for some unknown reason you chose to use that as your primary key, terrible primary key, but you could, you'd, ha you'd have three indexes and maybe one compound index for all of those. On the other hand, if you have a surrogate key, but you still need to search by SIN number, by phone number, and by name, you still have to have one more for the primary key, which is surrogate. That means you have N plus one. You always have one more. But it's a number. It's not going to be a big index anyways. But that's the only valid argument against surrogate keys. Compared to everything else that was discussed before, it's such a minor nitpick that yes yeah well that's part of it right yeah, yeah that's just it it's it is a con as in the sense that there's one more structure being maintained and the data server needs to maintain this one more structure it doesn't care. I mean, it's so fast anyways that it'll, you'll never see the difference. But the people that come in from back in the day, I'm talking, you know, the old timers. Anybody here ever watch the movies where the computer is using tapes and they're going, you know, the tapes are going back and forth? Those guys really cared about how many indexes because there was a lot of movement. Nowadays when, you know, you have an NVMe drive where the, the drive is actually faster than the RAM in my first computer, it's not much of an argument, you know. Computer hardware is so fast now, even the hard drives, as slow as a spin disk is, those 7200 RPM drives, are, there's still such a small impact that it makes no difference. Okay, relationships. Yeah, you wanted to know about relationships, vaguely. Okay, relationships, the connection between entities. And what that means is how are different entities related? What are the connections between them? And it allows for an organized data structure. In other words, not everything's just dumped into one big bin. And, you know, whenever you need to find something, you've got to dig through the entire bin and look at every single thing. Um, I know that's how some people organize their schoolwork where everything just goes into a big pile in their bag, and then once a month they just empty out the bag and they start sifting through everything they put in there. Uh, that was my daughter for a while. It was exciting to watch when things were due. A stack of paper that thick that comes out of her bag. It was hilarious. She got better in high school. It was really bad in grade school. But it allows for organized data structures. Now, there's a couple different kinds of relationships. The most common type is one-to-many. This one's really easy to understand. One teacher teaching 8215, section 310, many students. One to many. You guys actually have an inverse relationship similar to that. Each of you individually takes more than one course. So f as far as the school is concerned, one of you, many courses. There just so happens to be that the courses connect the teachers and the students. Same thing with um, a mother and their children. Notice I'm not saying father. Guys, we lose out on this one. 
mother, children. A mother can have one or more children, or none, zero or more children. Each child can only ever have one biological mother, right? Just the one. So that's a really visual concept that's easy to understand, right? You, a woman can choose to have zero or more children. Each child doesn't get to choose anything. You don't get to choose your mother. You don't get to choose your father either, but for this example, you don't get to choose your mother. Uh, sometimes the father is out unknown also, so, you know, depending on who you are. So that's why I can't use the other side. But that having been said, that's a really good example of one to many. It's one, uh, so for example, another example, you went to Loblaws, blah, blah, bought yourself a big bag full of junk food because you're feeling stressed after dance class. So your receipt will have many entries, but each of those entries after you've walked out of the store belongs only to that one receipt. One to many. Okay. Many to many. This is a fictional relationship. It exists at the conceptual level. It is almost impossible to do at the physical level unless you live in Kentucky. For those of you that are not from North America, sorry, you're not going to get that joke. Feel free to look up Kentucky Cousins for those of you that don't understand that. But essentially what it is, it's multiple relationships between two tables. In other words, a table's related something in this one, this one's related something in this table, this table's related something in that table, back and forth, and it ends up being a big web of connections. It is very hard to maintain, and it's pretty much frowned upon, as in, if you're doing this, you're a tool. If you don't know what that phrase means, it means you're an idiot. Many to many at the physical level is a really bad idea. Normally you'd use something else to mimic the structure. So for example, if we really want to go about this to explain a many to many relationship, at least as it would apply to you guys right now, many students, many teachers. Each of you is connected to one or more teachers and each teacher is connected to one or more students. Thus, there is a many-to-many -many relationship between students and teachers. Now, how would you just represent that in the database? Yes? What happens if I teach more than one course? Therefore, I need to be somewhere. So you end up with this weird, this crosshatch. Yeah, you end up with these weird, where the primary keys relate to foreign keys that relate back to primary key. You end up with this weird crisscross connection between entities. It's a really bad idea. So somebody came up with a clever idea, and they're known as an associative entity. It's a special kind of entity. It's an entity that bridges more than one other entity. So for example, in here, the bridging entity is actually, believe it or not, a section. Because this summer, there's two 8215s that are running, and there's two different teachers teaching it. However, so this bridging entity is known as an associative entity. It usually bridges one or more tables, well, two or more tables. In this case, you could call it section. What is this section entity made up of? It's made out of a student, one student, one teacher, one course code. Those things make the connection. And if you want me to actually draw it, I, that I can do. So if I go for the first side of it, and I go, if I were to say students, teachers, and we want to discuss about, and I'll discuss what these symbols mean, this is many to many. You know, students can have many teachers, teachers can have many students. Great, except for the fact that's impossible to maintain. So in the end, what we have here is we also have a course and we have a section. And I th I'm pretty sure I got these in the slides in a f one or two, in a couple more slides what those symbols are. But each student can belong to more than one section. 
Each course can have more than one section. Obviously, this summer we're running two copies of 8215, one for the CP students, which is you guys, one for the CET students, which is the other guys. And then the teacher's table, which during the summer most of us are only teaching one course, but in theory we could be teaching two courses or more, or more than one section, I should say. So th this is made out of a student, a student, a course, and a teacher makes up this and is bridged. This table allows you to connect all the other tables. That's an associative entity. It bridges multiple tables. Normally when you look at it, when I discuss what the symbolology means, you know, one of these will have many of these, but these can only ever have one. Like the combination of each of these must be unique. In other words, you can't take, you can't be in two different sections of 8215 at the same time. That'd be kind of dumb. Can you imagine the stupid workload you'd have? You'd have to same, they take the same course material from two different teachers with two different sets of labs and two different sets of assignments. Actually, that's not true. We're running three sections. We're running one in Carlton and Carp for whatever reason this summer. I wish I had his section. He's got like 22 students. So much less work. But that's an associative entity. It allows you to bridge other things. Now we got the one-to-one. One-to-one -one. One -to -one is very rare. It's used to divide really big tables, and even that's an excuse. There once was a time where database servers only allowed you to have so many attributes per entity. In other words, you could only have so many columns on a table, and then the server would say, ah, you suck. Um, God, I don't know if there's anybody enough old enough in here to remember DBase. Um, there once was a database system called DBase. That was my introductory database server when I was in school. And DBase limited you to, I think if I remember right, 32 columns per table. So you'd only put 32 attributes for a given entity in a one table. And if you needed more than 32, you had to create another table and keep the rest of it going in that one. Then you'd have a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. There's no real reason to do it nowadays. It's gross to do that. Um, however, there are a few cases. Uh, it allows you to isolate part of the original table for security reasons. Uh, if you happen to have a database server that doesn't allow you to have what they call column level security, as in you can say, you're not allowed to see SIN numbers, but you're allowed to see SIN numbers. If the database server doesn't let you do that, then you end up splitting in the table. That's security, because then you can say, well, you're not allowed to see this table at all. It's like it doesn't even exist, but you're allowed to see this table. Short-term data, that's OK to delete. Um, session cookies is a good example of a one-to-one. -one. But even that's a little bit of an argument, because normally it wouldn't even be in the same database. You'd use a high-performance database for sessions, as opposed to that. But short-term data would be stored in there, because you could just nuke it, say, nightly. Or you want to break down part of the data so that some of the data may not apply to, to the whole table. Uh, user profiles is a good example. You know, what are your interests? What did you eat for supper last night? Did you eat supper last night? You know, that kind of stuff. It's not important to the primary data, but you might want to track it. That's another use for the one-to-one. -one. Honestly, there's almost no reason to ever have one-to-one. -one. Okay, cardinality and optionality. Cardinality represents how many. Now, you've heard me say one or more. In actual fact, really the phrase should be zero, one, or more. In other words, it's possible to have you in the system as a student, and when you first register, you have zero courses assigned to you. Right? However, you could have one or more courses assigned to you. So that's zero, one, or more. So that's the cardinality and the optionality. Optionality says, must you have at least have one entry or not? So is this required or not? And cardinality rep represents one or more. There's symbols that go with this. And if, if I remember right, it's going to be close. Oh, do I not have it in here? Oh, I'll pull them up in a minute. Damn, I edited my slides and I deleted it by accident.
Earlier, as you saw me putting these little symbols, and we were talking about the cardinality and the optionality, this is where the symbols show up to the party. And I'll make sure I put that on Brightspace so that you guys have it as a visual reference. So the first one you have is there's two symbols in everything. And essentially, you got, if you draw a line right down the middle here, which this circle's in the wrong spot, go figure. You want to go like this, you've got two symbols. You've got the one right at the end of the line, and you've got the one next to it. Now, the one very at the end of the line. So, in this, you've got the straight up and down line, and then you've got what they call the crow's foot. This is called the crow's foot notation. If you've got a single line, that means one. If you look at it, it looks like a one. Right? So one has been cut in half, but it's a one. And the other one looks like a crow's foot, like three toes. That means many. So you know when we talk about the... The how many side of it. One, the one means one and only one. This means there can be many. For example, can you imagine if you went to the grocery store and you had to get a new receipt for every single thing you bought? You pull up with your shopping cart with $300 worth of groceries. Yes, I know your students, and $300 of groceries is something you don't normally see. But you're going to pull up with $300 worth of groceries. That's like two steaks. But in your cart, you've got you know, a pack of cookies. You've got you know, a couple of, a pound and a half, two pounds of bananas, a bag of potatoes, you know, a bag of rice, a couple of taco kits, a package of fake meat. Yeah, well, it's Loblaws. <laughs> I've said there for their pricing. But I'm just using that as an example, right? Now imagine if every single time you want to buy your package of fake meat, beep, you pay for it, put it in the bag. Get in a piece of paper, put it in the bag, you know. That's one. A many would be, A, I'm allowed to buy all this and pay for it once. So that's the many. So you're allowed to have many things on that one receipt as opposed to only one thing at a time. The other one is the next symbol over from the end of the line, which is mandatory or optional. Optional is easy to remember because it's a circle, looks like an O. Mandatory is a line. I don't know why they chose that, but it's a line. So when you look at the end of the line and you look at your two symbols, you'll have one that says it's one or more and whether or not it's required or not. Back to the student versus courses. When you first sign up, you're here as a student, you may have, you may or may not have courses, and you can have one or more courses. So the symbol for that would literally be this one. So you're a student, you're over here, courses is on this side. You may or may not have courses, and you're allowed to have more than one. So you're allowed to sign up for multiple courses. That's an example of on the other hand, a section, when you define a section like this, a section cannot exist, a single entry in section cannot exist without a student, a course, and an instructor. In actual fact, that's a lie. That one's optional. There's been cases where this doesn't get filled in until two days before the course starts. So if you want to talk about the symbology, it would be like this, a student may have a course, may have more than one course, but a, a sec, I mean a section, but a section cannot exist without a student. And any given entry in the section, there can only ever be one course for each student in that section. So that's the symbology, the crow's foot. And I'm going to save this image so I can put it on Brightspace. And I'll put it on bright space when we're done. Okay, we're almost done with the slideshow. And depending on the time. Okay. All right. Naming conventions. This really applies 
for when you're dealing with physical diagrams, just saying. So when later in the term when you're creating physical diagrams, this is when this kicks in. And this the second last slide, just so you know. Naming conventions part one. Now, back in the day, naming conventions used to be loose and free, as in there was no rules. You named it whatever you named it, and you were happy with it. Because often there you had one database designer, he did all the changes, and most people used to work for companies and they were what they call lifers. Something you don't that's becoming less and less common nowadays where you work for a single company for your, pretty much your whole life. It's not as common now. So therefore things were loose and free. And because of space constraints, the naming used to be really cryptic. How, who here remembers floppy drives? If good old floppy disk gets good, I don't feel that old. Okay, do you remember how little you could actually fit on those floppies? Now, for those of you that don't remember, I'm talking about the big ones, the five and a quarter inch jobs. Single sided, single density. 720K. If you don't know what that is, the average picture on your phone would fill that floppy disk five times. So when you had to store data on something that had so little capacity and you needed to <coughs> actually keep track of what things were called, you got really clever. You have a table called A. And the fields are called A1, A2, A3, because that didn't take up, doesn't take up a lot of room, as opposed to last underscore name. Gross. Each company has its own standards. Even nowadays, that's true. Um, especially in the world of database, because there's still minor holy wars of what things should be called. And it's never going to change, because it's all opinion-based. There's no actual science behind it. Often each developer would have his own version of it, which sucked. Where I'm at now, one of our database servers has over 300 tables in it, one of our databases. And you can actually tell who worked on what over the last 20 years because the tables, the naming's weird on some tables. Because, you know, one person worked on it, then the person left or they were transferred somewhere else and somebody else took over that piece of work and they put in their own two cents worth. It was really gross. And that could cause all kinds of grief because there's no f rules being followed. Uh, however, thanks to modern development frameworks, a de facto standard is starting to emerge. For those of you that don't know what de facto means, it means it's a standard that is agreed upon that is not in writing. So, for example, a, an actual standard that we all know about would be XML. Let's go with XML. XML has a standard. It has very specific rules. Most people ignore them, but it has very specific rules. However, a de facto standard would be, hey, guys, I start class at 305. It's not a written rule. That's just a standard I've adopted. Or here at the school, we have a de facto standard of you end your class 10 minutes before the, uh, the end of your class so that the other teacher has time to come in and get set up. There's no written rule that says this is the rule. We just have a de facto standard that says be nice to the next guy, you leave. Now, <coughs> the modern frameworks are developing a de facto standard. And the, the, the primary source of this, this de facto standard is a language called Ruby. Ruby's dead as a language, just so you know. Well, Code that's written in Ruby will always be written in Ruby. Very few people are writing new code in Ruby. Be because Ruby came out and it came out with this fantastic concept called Rails. Ruby's a language, Rails is a framework. They're not the same thing. Rails had this piece of magic built in. If you name things in your database a certain way, Ruby knew what to do with it automatically. So now, no, it's really magical actually. It's kind of freaky when you start dealing with it. And all the other developers of all the other web languages looked at it and said, holy crap, we never thought of that ourselves. God, we're tools. So then within three years, pretty much every other language had its own frameworks, plural. Rails has one framework. 
I mean, Ruby has one framework that's called Rails. Last time I checked, PHP has over 100 different frameworks. Um, Python's got four or five. Java's got one, because it's so hard to work with. Uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, the C Sharp side of it, actually has three separate frameworks. And essentially, almost everybody agrees to these rules. And what's cool is I could design my database and with very small changes, I can make it work from, an, a, from a PHP framework to a Python framework with very minor database structure changes. Back in the day, you actually had to custom write every single piece that took to the database. But with the frameworks, you can let the code do some of the heavy lifting for you. And here are the rules. And as I say, I tell you, my slides on Brightspace don't have that wording at the top of the naming conventions because I was told I have to make it clear that these are my rules that I'm applying. Because there is a book out there by CJ Date. It's like that thick, and you're going to want to pass out within two pages. He, he has his own naming conventions. And depending on what school you went to, you know that's the, considered the Bible of database design. Um, but in my class, these rules are going to follow. Because if you go do web development and you use a framework, they're almost going to be identical to this. So I might as well start training you now. And by the way, Microsoft agrees to these. so. When IBM and Microsoft both agree to the same thing, you almost never see that. And this is pretty much the rules they're following. So it's a good thing. Rule number one, everything is lowercase. Period. No exceptions. I see camel case, I take points off. Yes, it's painful because you're coming from Java where everything is camel case. No camel case in my world. There's actually a reason for that. Data some database servers are very case sensitive, some are not. <coughs> it's easier, easier to cater to the ones that are case sensitive as opposed to the ones that may or may not be case sensitive. <coughs> Excuse me. MySQL is not case sensitive. Postgres is anal retentive about its case sensitivity. Microsoft SQL Server depends what code page you've installed it on. If you don't know what code page is, that means what language it's installed in. If you install it with one version of the code page, it's case sensitive. If you install it with a different version of the same code page, it's not case sensitive. So it just depends what side of the bed it got up on that day. Oracle lies. Oracle makes everything uppercase whether you want it to be or not. So make it lowercase. Oracle will lie anyways and make it uppercase. No spaces ever in your object names. When you're doing the conceptual diagramming, that's fine. Uh, the physical, never spaces. Why? Rule number one, the SQL language, which you're going to learn later, uses space as a keyword delimiter. Java doesn't care about spacing. SQL cares. So between magic keywords, you have to have spaces in SQL. If you have a space in the middle of your table name, guess what's going to happen? It thinks you're now feeding it keywords, not object names. Use an underscore if you want to separate. Again, those of you that are used to, used to doing the camel case. So if you're used to writing, item list, that'd be the Java variable, right? In the database, you go item underscore list. It's just as readable. Actually, personally, I like it better. But you know, most programming languages want you to do this. In database, this is better because it's easier to read. For those of you that don't know what this is called, this is the opposite of camel case. It's known as snake case because it's long and sne uh, sneaky. Table names are plural whenever possible. There are cases where certain words imply plurality which the word cannot be plural. So you would have a table called students, not student. The students table holds multiple instances of students, of a student. So each of you is a single student. You put a bunch of students together. What do you have? Students. And people that who English is not their first language find this difficult because it's just not, doesn't come to you naturally. Some, you know. Exceptions, a good example of exemption is log, a log, ship's log, 
uh, whatever, star date, here's an entry. A log implies plurality. Is, in other words, it implies that there's going to be more than one entry because what's the point of having a... Imagine if you had a... You have your diary, right? For those of you that keep a diary or kept a diary. And imagine if it was known as a... You know, instead of diary, you'd call it diaries. This is my diaries. Because it holds many entries from my diary. No, it's a diary because a diary implies that there's going to be multiple things inside of it. That's one of the few exceptions. The other exception is when the word is plural and singular at the same time. There's rare exceptions to that. And one of the one I see often is people. People argue about people all the time. Because people can mean more than one person. It can mean a people, as in the Irish are a people. Russians are a people. Well, I'm being really generic on that one for the size of that country, but, you know, using that as an example. At that point in time, people cannot be pluralized, so you may want to rethink your, your naming convention to which you decide to call the stuff. Primary keys are always called ID. Since, we're, uh, since basically I've convinced you guys to always use synthetic keys or surrogate keys, they're always called ID. End of story. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200 bucks. You call your primary key anything but ID, you're going to lose points in my, with the work you submit. That's at the physical level. Conceptual, not so much. Um, and foreign keys, there's a rule. And essentially, it's the singular version of the parent table name underscore primary key. In other words, if you have a user's table, and of course, the primary key is called ID, it would be user underscore ID. In other words, it's the ID of a single user. Where would you find the single user? In the user's table. There's logic behind the naming convention. And the frameworks all recognize this particular way of naming things.